bring on the host, Sam, the queen of rock and roll dogs. Hello everyone, I'm Sam, the queen of rock and roll dogs and the host of Vegas Rock Dog Radio. On today's show, I'm talking about knee health and those luxating patellas. So, stay right there. Hi everyone, welcome to the show. I'm your host Sam, the queen of rock and roll dogs and this is Vegas Rock Dog Radio. We are a show all about pets, people, pop culture and that's a big umbrella so we get to talk about lots of different things, don't we Jim? Etc, 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 etc. There you go, there's Jim, he's <laughs> the producer of the show, he's also my husband and in studio with with us today is Mr. Twix and Miss Thornton. They've had their five-mile walk this morning, and he's had a shower because he just gets dirty. He's a dirty dog, and we're going to talk about dirty dog toys later as well in the show. Well, Jim, before actually, before we get on with our weekly update like we normally do, let's tell everyone where they can find us on the Internet. Shall we do this like a quiz, Jim? <laughs> pentagram a face a phone. <laughs> pentagram a face a phone. That sounds like a Tadurkin. Yeah, pentagram a face a phone. <laughs> there, there you go. That's all in there. Great. Uh, great. Uh, the website is VegasRockDogRadio.com. And you will find us on Periscope, Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, Tumblr, and Instagram. We have a blog. The blog is the TheRockAndRollDog.com. And you can also find us, if you if you do not catch the live show, you can find us on iTunes, iHeartRadio, Spoke by Sirius XM, Spotify, uh, Podchaser contacted us this week. Now the show is up on, on Podchaser. And any podcast app you have, you can find us after the live show. No problem whatsoever. And do you know what, Jim? I do think I need new headphones. I swear, I think my headphones are just bleeding. They, <laughs> Sounds they, dreadful, they doesn't might it? Be because you're deafening me right now. So, y oh, so you should just pull one of your cans off your your ear. Yeah, and then, then turn but me up. Then off. I can't listen. Then I have a job to do. Sorry. Ah. Oh. So just go on then. Can you turn it up for me? I just did. Tiny bit more. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> but you didn't. You just pretended. You just pretended to turn my headphones off. Just continue. You just pretended. People want to know what you have to talk about, not <laughs> about your problems. Go on then. Well, it's actually a good thing to be able to hear what the heck I'm doing. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> that's where you'll find us on the internet. And that was Jim's version of the Tadurkin with the social media hybrid word. So that again, what was it? Pin to Instapodgram. <laughs> <laughs> Put that Fitbit back on your wrist. Get some workouts. Oh, on that. you know what's it? You know, I think I'm going to tell you about this. First of all, Fitbit, can you make one for a left-handed person so that the button's not on the opposite side of your wrist? That is just not logical. It's ridiculous. You know how you can normally, like with your phone, you could turn your phone upside down on the side and it'll still work. You can't do that with Fitbit. Anyway, and here's another issue. I'm a very poor sleeper as it is. And every time you turn over in bed and you move your hand, it lights up like a flipping disco. I'm sure you could change that. So. I don't know. I'm going to have to figure out because I don't need that every time I move. But you know what's interesting? It says I've done a lot of steps during the night. <laughs> you probably have. You uh, sleepwalk yeah. and you sleep talk. And you, and yeah. you're all, you were talking last night. Oh, the night before. Ridiculous. I know I was full on. I, couldn't, I knew I was yeah. doing it. I couldn't stop myself. It's a very interesting state of mind. Anyway, I'm getting a little bit off track here, but let's start with tip of the week, and then we'll do a little weekly update and stuff that's in the news. Something just came into us um, literally minutes ago that we're going to tell you about. I think you'll be quite excited to, to um, know the details of. But the first thing is tip of the week. If you are entertaining the idea of moving your pets to a raw diet, but you're still a little bit overwhelmed, 
at the thought of fully preparing your pet's food and doing all that research. And I think you do have to make it a project. You don't want to go into it willy-nilly, as we say, because you need to be able to come up with a balanced diet for your pets. Uh, like I said last week, forget the whole chicken and rice. That is not a balanced meal, my friends. But if you are feeling like, I really want to go in that direction, well, you know, I've got a couple of easy steps you can take to just get that one step closer to your raw feeding goals. See, it doesn't always have to happen all at once. It, it, there is a learning process to it, and you want to make sure you're doing it right. Because at the end of the day, uh, your pets are in your hands. <laughs> but a very easy transition to get away from processed kibble, yeah, and all kibble is processed, is, uh, is to, first of all, you could buy a dehydrated base mix. You know, like the one you can get from Dr. Harvey's or the Honest Kitchen. And then what you'll add to that is your uh, your raw protein. Some people still choose to cook it slightly until they get the confidence. But that way, you're taking another step closer. It's a closer to that goal of raw feeding. And it's a, li- it's a nice little transition people are comfortable with. So that's one well, way. Why do they cook it a little bit? Well, I mean, it's if just, you raw know. is good because a pet has, has the acids in their stomachs. They can handle it. Well, so it's just to make a person and, feel and, better. And, you know, you do destroy some nutrients when you when you cook. You do. But some it's a it's a thing for the people. It's a people thing. Get over it. They get <laughs> yes. Just get over it. No, what's your other saying that you say to people? Get it together. Get it together. <gasps> the we pets have a different chemistry than we do. Well, I know that. You well, may not eat it. People. But they may. <laughs> you may give a, t- a word. <laughs> a toad will not give you a wart, but you may give a toad a wart. <laughs> oh, you see how the show's going already. <laughs> All these crazy references. It's a people thing. It's a confidence thing. Sometimes I'm like, oh, I don't know. It just freaks me out. You know, I, and I've always said this. Try and get some progress before you worry about perfection. You'll get there step by step, and eventually you'll get over it, and you'll be doing your raw before you know it. But another step, which makes it incredibly easy, and <laughs> seriously, there's seriously little prep to it, and that is to buy a pre-made frozen raw food uh, uh, from your, you know, your local. It l- it's going to be more of a boutique pet store that's going to sell this, so just you know, be aware of that. And it, I say, it requires uh, no help really from you other than defrosting it. <laughs> And Answers is a fantastic pet food company. And let me tell you, balanced. It's got everything in it. Your your pets would need meat, organs, bones. And there's a small percentage of carbs. They have two different types of um, of uh, foods that they put out there, different kinds of proteins. They do the raw goat's milk. They do the bone broth. Uh, it is, I've got to tell you, really a fantastic company with so much integrity, and they're very accessible. If you have questions, you can email them, give them details, and send you a little consultation thing back. Brilliant, absolutely brilliant. But they are very, um, ac- I'd say, accessible. They do a lot of Facebook Lives. But it is a balanced meal. It's, uh, they've got fermented vegetables in there. And um, I'd say a company that's, that's, that's high quality, r- and they truly do care about your pet's diet. They truly care about your pet's diet. So that makes it super easy and uh, you know you could uh, you know then add the, g- the goat's milk to it and um and really have a lot of confidence in that now some people stick right with that and they go you know what my pet's getting everything it's raw it's convenient because i can buy tons of it and put it in the fridge and i don't have to prep it and they've kind of done the work for me so that's a great step to take as i say answers i can't say enough about answers and so that is my tip of the week and how to get yourself closer to the goal of raw feeding your pets. And we do know that they, they we don't want them to just survive. <laughs> we want them to thrive on fresh food. It's the same for us. And that kind of leads us into what I received this morning from um, Emma Rutherford. She is a functional, oh, I've got the wrong glasses on here to read. Hang on. She is a functional canine dietary consultant, holistic canine nutritionist. Yeah. And she appeared on a well-loved TV program in the UK. Couple, couples come dine with me. Yeah. You know, I love anything to do with the, K, the UK. And um, in its 14-year history, they've never had anyone serve dog food to their fellow contestants. But Emma did it. <laughs> Yay, Emma. <laughs> Emma, I am assuming you are British also. I need to know where you live. (laughs) 
I would love it if you live near where I come from, Sheffield, because the next time we visit, we need to get together. Um, and she created a menu. Y I really love this because I think it really proves a point. She created a menu with starters, a main, and a pudding. For, for the Americans, Jim, do you want to do the translation of pudding? Gooey cake. No. Oh, my God. Sometimes I wonder. I'm looking at sticky toffee pudding right now. I know you are. You're looking at Jasmine's. Yeah. I know. You saw that. I'm too. psychic. <laughs> I swear. How did you know? A pudding is a dessert, yeah. Anyway, yeah. she created this menu with starters, main, and a pudding that both humans and dogs could safely share with each mm, other. Delicious. Delicious, yeah. To promote the idea on national TV of feeding a whole fresh living food diet, yeah? This is what we keep talking about. Fresh. We want it to be alive. And uh, Emma has been running the campaign hashtag Feed Fresh for many years now. Uh, to celebrate going on the show, Emma, Emma set up this Facebook Live event. And she's going to be talking about why she created the recipes, some behind-the-scenes filming fun. Well, you know, I love behind-the-scenes stuff, and I love the blooper reel. That's my thing. Because I, <laughs> I think I could fill hours and hours of a blooper reel with some of the ridiculous things that have come out my mouth on this show. Um, so I, I will look forward to that. She's done lots of giveaways of raw dog food hampers and other goodies. And uh, some special guests are going to drop by. Um, and there's a fun competition. And she says, best of all, and this is what I really like for all of you, is that you'll be able to get the recipes from the TV show itself. I looked at that list. I'm telling you now, that menu, fantastic. Delicious. Delicious. <laughs> Delicious. And now the event. Let me tell you where it's taking place. It's uh, on the Holistic Dog, Dog Care Facebook group. Of course, I'm going to link all of this in the show notes, and we will share it through our social media. And it is February the 19th, which is what day? Because I'm all discombobulated mm, right now. I see that right now. What, what day are we on now? 16, 16, 17, 18, 19, Tuesday, Tuesday, Tuesday at 7 p.m. If it's if it's GMT, that is going to be 11 a.m. At least Vegas time. <laughs> but we'll, we will clarify. So you can find their Facebook page by going to facebook.com backslash groups backslash holistic dog care. And I uh, want to thank Emma for sending that information in. Sounds like it's gonna, going to be a really, really fun event. And uh, Emma, if you're listening in, feel free to share that straight on our Vegas Rock Dog radio page. We would be glad to have that on there. And uh, I have to say, the menu looked really great. I mean, really, really good. So there you go. So that, that leads into, like I say, you know, we know how fresh food is good for us. We know it's good for our pets. So why are we not all doing that? This latest in, since we're talking about food. Yeah. Couples who drink together <laughs> all right. are less irritated by each other. <laughs> Scientists say. Ju what kind of drink? Alcohol? Exactly. Yeah, because you know what it is? It blanks you out from your partner. <laughs> <laughs> then you can tolerate them. Or you, that's if you, if you even know they're there, in all honesty. That's funny. So there you go. We've got a big theme of fresh going on in the show today. So thank you, Emma, for sending us that information, and we'll share that with everybody. Sounds like it's going to be lots and lots of fun. Now, let's go on to... Bef uh, before we get on to luxating patellas, I kind of like saying that. Let's get on to dog toys. I think I am that person. Let me tell you something. I am that person. I'll only use a towel one time. I only wear my clothes one time. I'm continually washing the dog blankets and our blankets and cushions. <laughs> a little bit obsessed, yeah. Same with the dog toys. But have you ever thought about the germs on your dog toys? It's something that I've always paid attention to because I think I'm becoming more and more of a germaphobe, wouldn't you say, Jim? Yes, your oddness is kicking in. That's all right. Higher I level. I embrace my oddness. At least it's clean around here. Uh <laughs> unlike your mother, who says that germs are good for well you. Well, you do, yeah, but this is it. She's right. You, I ex you, you put me at risk all the time. You make me touch door handles like, oh, oh you, yeah. you can have germs in your life, but I, I don't want any near me. It's kind of even rude. That's all right, Jim. It is rude. It's okay. 
Rude. I'm like the queen of trying to open doors with elbows. Mm. <laughs> Rude. <laughs> well, it's something I have always paid attention to when it comes to the cleanliness of my pet's toys. And they can get dirty so quickly, especially those soft toys when they, they have a lot of saliva on them and they're dragging them outside through the dirt or your pet hides them in really weird places. And, ugh, of course, they're going to attract bacteria and yeast and mold. And have I grossed you out? You know, see that, Jim? <laughs> I don't get grossed out by germs. The National Safety Federation, NSF, conducted a study to find the germiest items uh, in a typical home. It's going to be your bathroom in, in sink area in this house. Why would you say that? I don't know. That was just so random. Uh, just came and off so the top of my so head. so wrong. My areas don't have any. Uh, all right. Any right. Let's do a swab test. Let's see how that goes down. <laughs> It seems like we cannot get a single thing out today without going all over the houses, all around the neighborhood. Oh, my goodness. Anyway, I'm sure that the study was not called How to Find the Germiest Item, but I, I really like that word. Anyway, surely you'll not be surprised that dog toys made the top 10 list. And in this particular study, 22 families swabbed 30 household items to measure for various types of bacteria and other organisms. Pet toys were found to contain yeast, mold, and staph bacteria. Bad news. Really bad news. And there was a survey by Petco that found that one third of pet owners were not aware that dog toys collect dirty dirt and bacteria yeast and mold. What? I hope we don't have kids. <laughs> mm. <laughs> and uh, they do have some guidelines by NSF and this is what they recommend. That everyone in the household wash their hands after playing with pets and handling their toys. I never wash my hands after playing with my pets. I'm What's going NSF to be honest. What does stand for? Nasty stinky. <laughs> what does it mean? <laughs> National Safety Federation. Oh, oh my gosh. I, I'll be honest with you. I don't wash my hands after I've played with my pets, but handling their toys, especially before eating. Yeah, I get that. Uh, what if you kiss your dog on the nose after they put their face in some other dog's poop? Well, I've done it. I, I clearly have done it. You've mm. done it. No. <laughs> Uh, wash your dog toys monthly. Oh, I think that's too long in between toys, personally, or more often if needed, especially the treat-releasing toys and the ones that you stuff with food and then you stick it in the freezer. Uh, these types, uh, these steps help prevent disease-causing organisms from being transferred to you or potentially making your dog sick. And by handling dirty dog toys, you have to think about the bacteria and viruses that may cause respiratory illness, parasites, or fecal contaminants. May, and they may all be transferred by handling dirty dog toys. Yeah. Tina raised her head on that one. Did she? Don't, don't worry about it, Tina. No, it's all she good. is not a toy girl. Mm. She is not bothered. She loves a bone and something she can chew on. Bone, but walking, sleeping. Not bothered about toys in the slightest. And tri Twixie Pants, well, anything is a toy to him. A shoe, a sock. He steals Jim's socks the minute he tries to take them off. He actually, s s you know, snatches them and runs off into Jim. But he does mm. love a toy. He loves a soft toy. And it's gross. Mm -hmm. Anyway, here are, here are some tips on how you can wash certain types of toys. Hard toys. For hard toys, you're going to wash with hot, soapy water and rinse and rinse and rinse and rinse and rinse. Use a toothbrush to scrub the surface and get into all those crevices where those germs like to lurk around. You can use a solution of one part vinegar to two parts water for toys that are extra dirty. And you can soak them and then you, again, rinse them thoroughly and let them air dry. Do not put them back in the toy basket when they're not thoroughly dry. Otherwise, you're going to set yourself up for more problems in the future. Rubber toys. Often toys are labeled as dishwasher safe, and you're instructed to place the toys on the top shelf of your dishwasher for the best level of disinfection. You do not need to add detergent. Just run them through this hot water cycle, and if they're not dishwasher safe, don't put them in there because you risk the plastic breaking down. Soft toys. Uh, to me, I think these are the ones that get the dirtiest the most. Uh, toss them into your washing machine. Use the sanitized cycle. And if the toy is more delicate, you can wash it on cold. Use natural fragrance-free detergent. I do not use detergent. I do not use detergent. I would say use soap nuts. They're natural. They look like little dates, shriveled up dates. They look like hazelnuts. They, do, they have got saponin in them. But it's not soap. There's no soap. There's no detergent. There's no fragrance. There's none of that. And you don't want your pets putting their toys in their mouth after that. Yeah. Anyway, so that's w that's the direction I would go in. And you can also add some baking soda and vinegar to your rinse cycle. Throw them in the dryer. 
and um, or you can actually put them in the sun to air dry because that really does kill off uh, germs. Rope toys. Not a huge fan of these, but um, have you ever heard, Jim, of microwaving your f- cleaning sponges, the one that you use to wash your dishes or clean your bathrooms with? Usually just buy a new one. <laughs> yeah, that's always a good tip too. But it's a common tip for killing bacteria. They found that if you... Uh, Throw your cleaning sponges in the microwave for two minutes. It will kill 99% of the germs. So with that being established, rope toys can be cleaned in exactly the same way. Wet them down, stick them in the microwave for a couple of minutes, and of course make sure there's no plastic or metal or any kind of rings or weird things on the actual rope toy. Now, caring for your dog's toys will keep them in good shape. And I think this is overlooked a lot. And how many times have you heard, oh, my dog chewed off a big piece of this toy, he's choked on it, oh, he's got to have surgery, he's got to have a scope, you know. So in previous shows, I've, I've talked about cleaning your pet toys once a week. And that's the time when you would also inspect your pet toys for broken pieces or um, sharp edges. Or if they're just too filthy, just throw or them chewed out. chewed off bases and, yeah. ma- and inside stuffing coming out. Y- oh, yeah, that really bothers me. That really freaks me out. Um, always bring your pet toys inside because the elements can cause mold and it can cause plastic to break down, especially in the heat, and you don't want anything leaching out of those and then, you know, your dog's putting them in their mouth. Which reminds me the squirrel has to go. I know. We have to constantly replace that squirrel because Twixie he likes to drag his toys outside and we do have extremely hot weather, so the risk of, of them breaking down is quite high. But I do love the idea of vinegar and baking soda uh, as a cleaning agent and personally i'm a, i would rather with them every week in all honesty and there's ev- with everything we do uh, with our pets you've got to have their health and safety in mind and always buy toys that are made in your country of origin you know so in the us or in the uk or canada australia um make sure that they're made of 100 percent natural um fibers organic cotton natural rubber other eco-friendly and contaminant free materials and as many of you have experienced when buying toys, strong strong chemical smell is a big no-no. Avoid it like the plague. So now that I've grossed you out about pet toys, <laughs> I would suggest the next time that you do buy toys that you uh, buy ones that can be easily cleaned and made of safe materials and will last. So there you go. Jim, do we have a commercial? We could try. We had a commercial that just disappeared this morning, but we're going to try and run our commercial for Pet Scene Magazine, and if it doesn't, I'll do a read of a commercial. <laughs> we gotta go. You gotta just go with the flow. Go with the flow. So, uh, you're listening to Vegas Rock Dog Radio with me, Sam, your host, the Queen of Rock and Roll Dogs, and we will be right back. Vegas Rock Dog Radio. Pets, people, pop culture. Pet Scene Magazine is dedicated to Las Vegas pets and the people who love them. It's a source of news and information for pet lovers, as well as offering valuable coupons and specials on pet products and services. Find them online at www.lvpetscene.com or look for them on Facebook. Vegas Rock Dog Radio. Pets. People pop culture welcome back so i guess that worked jim <laughs> I, can you um i'll have to save that playlist yeah because now it's working properly it's just weird you know technology you love it and you hate it uh, i don't like it <laughs> there you go that's jim's point of view okay so let's let's get on to it's a big topic it's a really big topic this and it's about we're going to talk about growth plates in puppies, and then we're going to talk about luxating patellas because oh, one I was looking forward to that. <laughs> one dovetails right into the next, and I found this very good article by Adrian Fariselli, CBDT K A, and it's about the impact of exercise on puppy growth plates. Exercise, as we know, is an important part of any pet's life. But how much exercise should you be doing with your new puppy when it comes to their development? Exercise does equal impact on the body, but what does it do to a young pup, in particular in particular on those growth plates? Now, new pet parents have a lot of questions, but they, uh, you know, when they first get their pets, or to be honest with you, a lot of them don't even think to ask some of these questions. But some of them are and should be 
can I take my puppy jogging with me? Um, can I take my puppy to agility classes? Can I go bike riding and have my dog run next to me? And I think it's important to know that too much impact on a pup's growth period can in fact have deleterious effects to the pup's developing skeletal system. What do you think of that, Jim? You're on that word thing again. I know. What's deleterious? I've never heard that word before in my life. You can look it up, Jim. <laughs> well, I continue. <laughs> um, so what are these puppy growth plates that I speak of? Um, they, the puppy bones are surrounded by layers of soft developing cartilage tissue that are found towards the end of most long bones. And these areas of soft cartilage are known as growth plates or a more of a technical term, they're called the epi epiphyseal, epiphyseal, epiphyseal <laughs> plates. So there's your growth plates. Scottish surgeon John Hunter studied growth plates in detail in the late 1700s. I did not make a mistake when I said that. His studies on growing chicken, chicken, I'm having trouble today speaking, even though I did all of my warm-up exercises. His studies on growing chicken revealed that bones do not develop from the center outwards, but rather bones grow lengthwise as a new bone is generated at the end of long bones, right where the growth plates are located. John Hunter's studies granted him the nickname the father of growth plates. <laughs> Sorry, I can think of a better name. <laughs> the father of uh, growth plates. And his contributions have surely helped both humans and animals. As one may imagine, since growth plates are made of soft developing cartilage, they are vulnerable and can be quite prone to injury. Now, puppy growth plate damage. So she goes on to further write in this article that when it comes to the skeletal development of puppies, it's important that puppies' bones go through even growth, basically synchronized growth that occurs evenly and as close to the same rate as possible. If an injury to a growth plate occurs, the growth of damaged cells may slow down and come to a halt, meaning there may be no longer growth on one side. And when the growing of the affected side is delayed and stopped, the unaffected healthy side may continue to grow, and this unevenness may lead to potential deformity. Most commonly, the forearm area is the affected. When the injured growth plate of the ulna stops growing, the radius bone will keep growing potentially, leading to one bone that is slightly longer than the other, and that can cause bowed legs. And that was a quote from veterinarian Dr. Gary. And puppies are particularly prone to injury during strenuous exercise because they lack coordination, they don't have, have a lot of muscle strength, so they don't have that framework, you know, for joints at that age. On top of you know, uh, excessive strenuous exercise, injury to a puppy's great growth plates may occur from a fracture and it can happen from a fall or being hit by a car. I mean, I it's easy for a puppy to get injured. And while these fractures may heal, the bone may grow unevenly, which, as we have seen, can lead to a deformity of the bone. And if you therefore suspect injury in your pup's growth plates or witness any or abnormalities, you do need to go and talk to your vet. Uh, and they say, did you know that some dog breeds have a mutation in their genes responsible for transforming cartilage to bone? And this causes shortened legs, a condition known as, here we go, achondriaplasia. That was good. And it's seen in basset hounds, sausage dogs, dachshunds, dash hounds, and corgis. I'm saying dash hounds. That's how we say it everywhere else except the States. We say dachshund here. Uh, now they say, you know, are they too young for agility at that point? And puppies do need proper exercise as they grow and develop, but moderation is key, and it's therefore important to be careful, especially with high-impact activity activities, such as repeated jumping, as to catch a frisbee, a frisbee, hurdling through obstacles or jogging, especially over hard surfaces such as asphalt and concrete. Turf offers, it, what they say, a more forgiving surface and better traction compared to hard cement or this asphalt. And sustained vigorous exercise, leg twisting activities, or very rough play should be avoided. So that answers that question. Uh, but so when can they start agility? And they say many puppy owners may find it surprising when trainers tell them that their puppies are too young to start competing in agility. However, puppy owners may start their puppies on some pre-agility basics, such as getting familiar with agility obstacles and other skills, foundation exercises that aren't particularly high impact, and therefore won't put strain on those delicate growth plates. And of course, talk to your vet and your agility trainer 
for when you can actually get started on that. And they said in um, there was a study involving over 200 agility dogs. It found that the tibia, radius, and ulna were significantly longer than the femur and humerus, respectively in dogs that were spayed or neutered at or prior to age, eight months of age, as compared to these impact do in intact dogs. We've talked about this before on the show, and I'm going to reference something a little because bit later of on. Because uh, they need all those hormones to mm -hmm. develop. That's right. Um, so when when does this these growth plates finally close? You know, they're fully formed. And it says, uh, as puppies develop, their growth plates close as calcium and minerals harden the soft areas. But exactly when, when does that happen? And since dogs develop at different rates based on size and breed, there, there's not a one answer for, you know, fits all. But, for example, growth plates in a chihuahua will close much sooner than a large breed such as a Great Dane. Generally, most skeletal growth occurs when puppies are between three and six months of age. After longitudinal growth decreases and by 10 to 12 months or up to 18 months in the large giant dog breeds, most growth plates have fused and closed. However, some suggest the process can take even longer, all the way up to 20 months. That's almost two years. And how can a dog owner know for sure whether a dog's growth plates have closed or not? Well, they say the best bet is to talk to your vet before starting your puppy on any kind of rigorous exercise or sport or, you know, that kind of thing. And for the best peace of mind, they say consider that um, that you should do an x-ray. And I guess that's the only way you would find out if the bones are fused or not. Um, or just wait. <laughs> just wait. Um, and on an x-ray, a vet will be able to tell whether they have uh, morphed into a solid integral part of the bone, leaving its only trace of existence under the form of a, a facile line as seen in the, there's a picture here. I will post all this for you. And they say most sports medicine vet veterinarians recommend to not begin training until growth plate closure, which depends on the size of the breed and can be anywhere up to 10 to 18 months of age. And that was a quote by Dr. Wendy Boltzer. Hormones. This is what I think is important. Hormones, hormones do play this important role in a puppy's growth plates and that's skeletal development. Growth plates tend to generally close, at say, between 12 and 20 months old, depending on that breeding size, and this happens to coincide with the end of puberty. Therefore, intact dogs' growth plates close after exposure to hormones. This is something I've talked about on the show before, and it's a big concern, because male and female sex hormones are known to play these key roles in closure of the growth plates. Therefore, if a dog is altered, so it's spay-neutered, spay Prior to puberty, there's a delay in the closing, which causes affected dogs to develop a rather leggy appearance, which makes them more likely to suffer from orthopedic problems such as hip dysplasia, CCL injury, and possibly even bone cancer. Now, here in Nevada, our spay neuter law states that your pet has to be fixed by the age of four months. Now, you can see where the problem lies right there. I have no idea who was consulted when they put this law together. Um, to, to choose that as a time frame, uh, it is not the correct time frame. And we're setting our pets up for future injuries. And, you know, decreases quality of life when, when you know, throughout, through, through this law, it's going to cause a lot of problems. I don't like that at all. I'll look a little bit into it. I don't know how long we've had that spay neuter law. I really don't know. Um, but I would be very curious as to who they consulted to come up with this number. Did they bring any professionals and specialists on? They were just worried about overpopulation. They didn't care about the other things. I love how they just think that's the... Uh, and I they always think that's the one solution to the goal. Spay neuter, spay neuter, spay neuter. It's a lot of different things to talk about overpopulation. Trust me. Spay neuter, they say that because people usually aren't that responsible. So you cover it with a law and then... Mm, it's awful, isn't it? It, it really is. And who suffers from that? The dog's suffer from that. That's terrible. But delaying neutering in large dog breeds may help reduce that incidence of orthopedic conditions. And the effects of neutering during the first year of a dog's life, especially in larger breeds, undoubtedly reflects the vulnerability of their joints to the delayed closure of the long bone growth plates. When neutering removes the gon gonadal or sex hormones, it's not a good thing. And, and that was a quote by uh, Benjamin Hart. Now, according to Chris Zink, DVM, uh, old Chris, this is what Chris says. <laughs> For example, if the female has achieved its genetically determined normal length at eight months when a dog gets spayed and neutered, but the tibia, which normally stops growing at 12 to 14. But there's a difference in the time frame there. 
and it continues to grow, then this abnormal angle uh, develops at the stifle, which is the knee joint. In addition, with the extra growth, the lower leg below the stifle likely becomes heavier because it's longer and may cause increased stress on the cranial cruciate ligament. Hmm. So that is your growth plate information. Now, this leads on to luxating patella in dogs. Um, this week, a friend of mine contacted me to let me know that her dog has a luxating patella. Uh, she wasn't sure at what degree, because they come in different degrees, and then treatment is different for each degree. Hence this week's big show topic. And this is often how the show happens. Real life things happen, and um, you know people reach out to me like my friend did. And so what I did is I used all the resources that I have, and I reached out to the veterinarians I know, and I managed to get her a lot of information that she can read upon. And sometimes you just don't know where to go for the information. And this particular friend of mine, she's very much into learning and learning as much as she can. And she tries to do everything as naturally as possible um, before going to anything quite extreme, uh, which is a great thing. Oh, are we naming that? Friend? Oh, yeah. It's our friend Patricia, her little peanut. I think peanut's 17 now. Really? Yeah. And here's the thing. You know how a lot of people go, oh, well, it's old age. No. Go all out. Like we say, the very least you can do for your pets is everything. So do everything for your pets. And this is what she is doing. So I gathered all this information for her. And, um, you know, it's, it's, she loves her dog. She wants her dog to have a great quality of life. And uh, ra age is not a reason to not take care, care of their health and just accept it as, oh, they're getting older. Anyway, so let's, let's talk about luxating patellas. Uh, it is painful, but it is treatable. And I think you'd be very happy to hear that. And um, some people have no idea what that means or what the heck you can do about it if you are given a diagnosis. Well, luxating patella in dogs is a common orthopedic dilemma that many pet parents uh, uh, face. And um, so in this article, uh, gosh, it covers everything you need to know about luxating patellas, um, particularly in dogs and the costs associated with it. I mean, it does happen uh, to cats as well. Um, patella luxation, it's a common muscu musculoskeletal disease commonly seen in many dog breeds. And um, like I mentioned earlier, the stifle, which is the knee joint, you have to kind of understand what the anatomy and bio biomechanics of it are so that you understand what's happened. And so in a simple description, dogs have a kneecap that's highly movable. I mean, we have the same thing. You know, as a kid, you would try and push your patella from right to left, and you thought it was really cool. <laughs> but the kneecap fits in a groove of oh, the we feet. We used to do that in school. I know. Oh, that's creepy. <laughs> the uh, kneecap fits in the groove of the femur bone, and it's called the uh, patellofemoral groove. And when a dog flexes and extends its knee, that's that kneecap slides up and down. And patella luxation simply means that the kneecap is no longer able to slide across the groove. Therefore, the kneecap has become dislocated. Yeah. And they say there are varying degrees of this. So um, medial luxating patella in a nutshell, it can be classified as either medical or la um, not medical, medial or lateral. Now, this just indicates the direction in which that kneecap may be sliding. And if a dog's patella is sliding on the inner aspect of the knee, then this is considered a medial luxation patella. Now, I mentioned human kneecaps. Uh, humans also deal with dislocated patellas. Uh, I think we see a lot of that with uh, football players, don't we, Shane? Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh. mm -hmm. And they're referred to as patella subluxation, which occurs as a result of injury or patella dislocation. And there is a difference between the two, between luxation and subluxation. And from a, a, this medical perspective, patella dislocation refers to the complete dislocation of the kneecap from the joint whereas patella subluxation refers to a partial dislocation. So now you know the difference. As I said earlier, cats. Cats deal with patella luxation too, uh, often caused by injury, or it can be congenital as well. But I feel like cats have this really good uh, framework around their joints because they're, they're very agile, they're very flexible, they're very nimble, and, you know, they, they can they can jump and recover really really quickly. Um, dogs not so much. I mean, think about the times our dogs have fallen out of bed at night. <laughs> they don't they don't land gracefully at all. They don't shake it off and go. Whew, I'm all right. <laughs> I mean, they just clunk and fall <laughs> fall out of yeah. bed sometimes. Um, and I <coughs> and I get blamed for it. Yes, because you're usually sticking your bum out, taking yeah. all mm. taking all the room yeah. up. It's my fault. Yeah, I'm like, don't push my dogs. Don't don't disturb them. 
You're not giving them enough room. They're hanging on the edge. <laughs> Hang on, just need a quick drink there. Um, so back to <laughs> back to the teleluxation in dogs. It is most prevalent in small dogs, but it has been increasing in large dogs as well. And the most common form of patella luxation is medial luxation patella. Uh, I think I'm going for a Guinness Book of World Records how many times I can say patella in one <laughs> in one show. It reminds me of the pancakes you had the other day. Why? Nutella. <laughs> Nutella patella. Um, and it can be caused by, get this, poor nutrition, injury, or it could be present at birth, so congenital. Uh, now, let's talk about genetics a little bit. Medial patella luxation is strongly associated with these skeletal deformities. This is therefore considered congenital. Therefore, it is not recommended that owners breed from these dogs for obvious reasons. And, and why subject a dog to health issues from the onset of its life? I mean, that's wrong. Skeletal deformities include an improper alignment of the quadriceps muscle, malformed trochlear ridges, tibial tuberosity, may be misaligned, and hypoplasia of the medial femoral condyle. I'm good. I'm good today on my words. People are going, uh-huh. Uh-huh. Uh. Poor nutrition. So, you know, why does that even play a role? But dogs who have poor nutrition and coupled with being overweight are at risk of developing joint problems associated with the kneecap. And this is due to an increase in pressure on the joint capsule and knee joint. Medical conditions, so that cranial cruciate ligament rupture or pain that has been commonly associ associated with patella luxation is another issue. And then we've also got some other symptoms. So before treatment options are even considered, veterinarians will often conduct a physical exam in order to determine the severity of the luxating patella. And the severity of uh, the luxation is often divided into four grades. So you may... You may give a toe to wart. <laughs> give a to no, you will give a toe to wart. A toad will not give you a wart. And if anyone's listening to that, that is from League of Gentlemen. It's Jim and I, like really off the wall kind of dark comedy kind of stuff. Anyway, there are four grades. And I think it's very interesting that you may have seen some of these symptoms and you may have not thought much of it, but I will talk about that in a second. So grade one, this is the dog with grade one luxation. They don't experience any severe pain while their kneecap does slide out of place. And it can actually easily, with manipulation, massage, be massaged back into place without surgical intervention. So that is grade one. And you're hoping you have a grade one. Trust me, everybody wants a low grade. Grade two, dogs with a grade two luxation often feel pain when their patella falls out of place. And these dogs also may develop associated problems such as arthritis. And despite this, the patella can be massaged back into place temporarily grade three dogs with grade three luxation will con constantly remain in pain uh, pain and can develop severe arthritis the kneecap will slide outside the groove most of the time but fortunately it can be manipulated back into place grade four the patella cannot be physically manipulated back into place therefore the dog will have a bow-legged appearance and will remain constantly in pain mm. Yeah, and the treatments vary from each of those grades. And here are these common symptoms. You may have seen them. We're experiencing it as well with one with Mr. Twix, and I'll talk about that. Uh, you can sometimes hear a popping noise and heard in the dog's knee, which I've heard when I sometimes pick him up. The dog will avoid bearing weight on the affected leg. Dog will be in pain and a very abnormal gait, a very strange way of walking. Think hopping and skipping. And none of these should be ignored at all. And who is going to be most susceptible to these luxating patellas? Well, unfortunately, it's small dogs and it's toy breeds. And um, it seems it's most common in these particular breeds, which is Pomeranian, Chihuahua, Pekingese, um, Miniature Poodle, Yorkshire Terrier, Toy Poodle, Basset Hound, Boston Terrier, Basset Apso, which is what Mr. Twix is, should do Karen Terra, ter Karen Terrier, <laughs> Cocker Spaniel, Pampion, American Pitbull Terrier, and they're saying now recent research has indicated those large breeds can also be prone to that, and um, they include the Great Pyrenees, Labrador, Golden Retriever, German Shepherd, Newfoundland, 
Ken Corso, great game. And um, I know Yorkies are very uh, susceptible to it. They said that they found that um, there was 26% uh, of Yorkies are affected by that. 26%. Too high. So what are your treatments? What on earth are your options? That's the one thing my friend wanted to know was, oh, he's saying it's going to be surgery. So that tells me he's at th they're at a grade four. And she goes, oh, I just don't really want to do surgery because Peanut's about 17 years old. So, uh, you know, that's why you need to explore as much as you can and get your experts on board and find out what's the best thing for your particular dog because there are some variables there. And there are many, um, there are many treatment options available. And here are some common treatment methods that, that can be done. There is a quadriceps uh, femoris realignment surgery. And that goal is to actually move part of the tibial tuber tuberosity towards the tibia bone itself. And here, this is what the surgeon aims to reposition the patella bone with the groove within the femur. And this procedure of realignment is referred to as tibial tuberosity transposition. And what uh, what they do is they do the, the deepening of the trochlear groove, as the name suggests, is where the surgeon simply just deepen that, God, like a carpenter, deepen the groove <laughs> at which the patella may be sliding against. And then there's the femoral oste osteotomy surgery. And during this surgery, the femur bone is cut above the knee joint and re-stabilized with pins and screws. Sounds like stuff you don't do unless you really have to. Yeah, that's, that sounds like grade sounds four like extreme. Sounds like, wow, that's a problem. And they say it's very complicated. It's quite a complicated surgery. Now, let's talk about some non-surgical things that you can do. I, if you're looking at grade one and grade two, then your veterinarian may simply recommend just these non-surgical methods of treatment. And the most common one is a knee brace, supplements, physical manipulation, and physical therapy. And they're all doable. And uh, perhaps your um, dog may need, you know, a dog brace. Uh, it is a common method of treatment, and they do stabilize that stifle joint. Knee braces are an alternative to surgery, and they can help with all sorts of problems, including cranial, cranial cruciate ligament rupture as well. I think he, I think it, this is one of those where you have to just do a holistic approach. You do everything that is necessary to to tackle the problem. And um, knee braces are quite beneficial for dogs suffering from from this. And canine knee brace by Neoprene is a knee brace uh, that's doing very very well. So it doesn't look so mechanical. It's a Neoprene which is really thick and it does have a lot of support. Uh, of course, you're going to do all of this with your veterinarian to figure out the best way. Supplements, I'm big on supplements, and it's it's pause. They say it's plausible to suggest that proper minerals and nutrients are essential for bone health. Yep, and this means that you should look into supplementing nutrients that will ensure your dog has proper collagen synthesis and the supply of antioxidants and proper bone growth. And let's not let's not ignore the fact they need some fresh food, like we talked about earlier. Uh, massage, great thing. Uh, they say it's a it's a great way to move the patella back into position, and it improves the mobility of your dog. It decreases pain and stiffness. It also gets blood flow going. Uh, our friend Brandy, she has a business called Animal Love and Logic, and she does uh, pet massage and grief counseling, but she she's a nurse also. So she has a lot of information that she can, um, you know, give to a client. And she, she was telling me, she says, I'm telling you now, blood flow, oxygenated blood, getting it to those joints, so important. She had to do it with her own dog. And she said, if I didn't massage my dog every day, he probably wouldn't have stood up and done anything. And she had a pool, so she got to, you know, train him in the pool as well. He exercised him in the pool. Um, but they say you can actually talk to you about how you can manipulate the patella back yourself. <laughs> uh, but when luxating patella treatment requires surgery, there are some things you do need to know. And uh, there are, of course, very severe cases that require this surgery. And um, it's, it's not cheap either, but... The way I look at it, you know what? They're worth every single penny our pets that we can, um, you know, spend on them to make them healthy. Um, they say there are, of course, post op care expenses as well. And there's going to be some hydrotherapy and some physiotherapy and follow up checkups and medication. So there's a lot involved in it. It doesn't come cheap. Um, they were, I was looking here, they were saying that in uh, 2016, 
to 2017, you're going to pay between 2300 and 2700 if the dog is less than 40 pounds. What's that got to do with it? <laughs> Any which way, <laughs> sometimes. Any which way, like 40 pounds. Oh, it's 41 pounds. It's going to be a lot more, more money. Um, uh, so that's, that's where you're going to be for the surgery itself. Um, it's quite a lot, isn't it? Um, and there are risks, of course. So orthopedic surgery can get quite expensive. And this is because, you know, orthopedic surgeons, you know, do quite complicated surgeries. And, um, you know, there's going to be post-op care. And, of course, you've got to be a really good pet parent and really comply with what is, you know, re required of you for your dog after after surgery. Like, yeah, like, um, your dog shouldn't jump around after we do this. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Stop. yeah, try that. Y well, you do. You try your very best, don't you? Because that's why, cr that's why crates are very good for rest. It's really important uh, that you figure out how you're going to keep them from jumping around. Um, here are some of the risks. Um, the surgical implant can migrate. Uh, there are pins that are used to, st uh, to stabilize that tibial tuberosity, and it can migrate to the wrong spot. Um, anesthesia, of course, they are a common risk. It's a common risk. Surgical infection. Um, your dog may not fully recover. You know, so that's a risk. And um, but they do. Uh, I'll be honest with you. The, the success rate is really impressive. So in 2016, this study took this overall look at these grade four medial patellar luxation surgeries, and they concluded that the generalized success uh, success rate was 93 percent. That's a great number. This is stuff that you have to do that you have to have it done. Yeah, that's, that's your grade four. I'm like listening to you tell all these words, and I'm like, no, this isn't something you go, oh, that dog doesn't look right. or, or No, the vet will help determine. The vet determines the grade, and then the grade determines the treatment. You don't get to say, yeah, just put them in for surgery when it's a grade one. <laughs> no. <laughs> Um, but with proper care and exercise, pets can begin properly using their recovering leg within six to eight weeks of surgery. Hey, Mater, he had two ACL surgeries. And Pam, she, um, you know what she did? She tied herself to her dog, basically, so that he could jump up and run around. She had Mater on a, uh, she had a thing around her waist. And she said, and we, and he'd never been in a crate, couldn't cope in a crate. So she basically just had him with her and they, slept on the floor and just that's they did everything with each other so that she could keep an eye on him so he wasn't jumping running and all that good stuff because uh, he really wants it. he's a runner he's a frisbee dog but she did she got him for that surgery and he's doing great you should see that dog run now crazy i think they call him like the million dollar dog because <laughs> you just keep spending money on him <laughs> he's worth it though we love him um so you're looking at six to eight weeks of surgery uh recovery po post surgery recovery hello um and of course you know um they say you know it's with it being prevalent in 98 percent of small breeds uh, and slightly less common in large dogs it, it's something we have to really pay attention to and they say regardless veterinarians and researchers strongly believe that any medial luxating patella problems are strongly associated with skel skeletal deformities and i think that goes right into us talking about spay neuter and cutting off the endocrine system. Because you can sterilize your pets without cutting all that off. I, I just don't think people know enough. I think that's the problem. And then you've got laws that people get frightened about. Oh my gosh, I'm gonna fix my dog at four months. And it's not good, is it? It's just not good. And sometimes you can't fix a dog because they're too old to go under a surgery. You know, and you get you you get you get a waiver for that. Um, there are some tips here which I really like for speeding up that recovery. They say post surgery improves your dog. Um, post surgery improve your dog's diet, providing nutrient rich, high food in high in vitamins and minerals. So you're going to get that from a fresh diet. Avoid intensive exercise and activity. They need that time to rest and recover. Keep the walking to a minimum. Don't allow your dog to run or jump around. And invest time in physiotherapy and hydrotherapy. Um, exercising your dog in water will allow pressure to be taken off the joints. I'm wondering if a hyperbaric chamber would be a good thing too. I don't know if we have one in town. For I pets. think there is for people. I know those. Oh yeah, it's just up the road. Yeah, yeah, it's just on the horizon. Um, and of course, we want to. And this is what I was most interested in. How do we avoid avoid this problem? What What are we looking for? And they said the only real way is to. Well, first of all, they say just stop breeding dogs who carry this gene for this disorder. 
Uh, patella luxation is strongly genetically linked. Therefore, some dogs may simply be born with it. And they say if you've got a dog at risk, and the best thing you can do is prevent your dog from getting overweight. Our vet always says that. Number one thing you can do, keep them at healthy weight. Feed your dog healthy food. Avoid intensive physical activity. Now, like we said, it is painful, but it is treatable. Um, and if you do suspect that your dog may have that going on, then definitely off to the vet you go. Just don't leave it too late. I did watch an incredible video by Dr. Karen Becker. I love her. She's fantastic. And it's very comprehensive, that video on luxating patellas. You know, what causes it, uh, what the grades are, as I discussed earlier, what the treatments are, treatment options and surgery complications. And, and the most important thing that she mentioned was if you see your dog doing that hoppy skippy thing and then they go right back to walking normally, you think, oh, that was weird. Don't ignore it. Do not ignore it because that is part of patella luxation, uh, the beginning of it. So don't ignore it. And what we're going to do, because Mr. Twix does that, doesn't he, Jim? He does a little hop, skip, and a jump once in a while. Oh, and he's a jumper. <laughs> he's a jumper. And, oh, my gosh, if you've seen some of my videos in the house and he's running up and down the hallways, it's like Scooby-Doo. It's crazy. But I think we really need to focus on getting him, you know, a really strong framework. And Dr. Karen Becker talks about that. She says, you know, if you've got strong muscles, if you do hydrotherapy, if you can take them swimming, you know, those kind of things, if you can improve their diet and their supplementation, then you're giving them a much better chance of that not getting any worse. So keep an eye on it. It's not a cute little hoppy. It does. It looks like a little rabbit. But it's it's so much more than that. Whoa, it's a big topic, Jim. But I have one more little nugget I'm going to throw in. Nothing to do with knees whatsoever before we close the show out. In your home state of Pennsylvania, Jim, they have found a rare half male, half female cardinal bird. <laughs> I don't believe it. Believe it. Because you know Jeffrey and Shirley. <laughs> a hermaphrodite cardinal. <laughs> I knew you were going to say that. We've been married for 24 years, my friends. <laughs> so I knew he was going to say that. Uh, Jeffrey and Shirley Caldwell have been attracting birds for 25 years with carefully tended backyard feeders. But the lifelong eerie Pennsylvania residents have never seen a creature so wondrous as half vermilion, half taupe cardinal. Its colors split right down the middle that first showed up a few weeks ago in the Dawn Redwood tree uh, 10 yards from their home. And they, in fact, they, they weren't sure they saw it correctly until it came closer. And they said, never did we ever think we would see something like this in all the years that we've been feeding. The anomaly is known as a bilateral mm, uh, genandromorph. <laughs> in plain language, it's half body, half of its body is male, the other half is female. And this remarkable bird is a genuine female male chimera said Daniel Hooper. He's a postdoctoral fellow at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. And that's what his little statement, ornithology, study of birds. Um, well we're, back that. we're back to the big long word here. <laughs> I'm probably going to pronounce it differently now. <laughs> Ganandromorphs, known as half-siders among ornithologists, are uncommon but not unheard of. They're likely, they likely occur across all species of birds, um, Hooper says, but we're only likely to notice them in species where the adult males and females look distinct from each other, a trait known as sexual dimorphism. Cardinals are one of the most well-known sexually dimorphic birds in North America. Their bright red plumage in males is iconic, so people easily notice when they look different. Hmm. They said, oh, apparently there's a yellow cardinal. It's like a one in a million bird. Um, so how the heck does this even happen? They said that... Um, Hooper says that the sex determination in birds is a little bit different than in mammals. In mammals, he says, males have one copy of each sex chromosome, Y and X, and while females and um, white females have and females have two copies of the X chromosome. In birds, it's the opposite. The sex chromosomes are called Z, or the, as, as they say here, Z, 
and W, and it's the females that have a single copy of ZW, whereas the males have two of the same, ZZ. <laughs> ZZ top, I'm going to get in before you, Jim. Uh, sex cells nuclei, nuclei, yeah, including sperm and eggs, usually have only one copy of either chromosome, and males produce only Z-carrying or Z-carrying sperm, and females produce either Z or W-carrying eggs. Anyway, this particular cardinal has been seen eating in the backyard of... Of the of their home, I bet they couldn't believe their eyeballs when they saw that. And they say it's uh, it occurs when a female egg cell develops with two nuclei, one with the Z and one with the W, and it's called double fertilize. Anyway, the chimeric individual then develops with half of his body as a male, half as a female. And if you were to examine a cell from the bright red male side, it would have cells from ZZ or ZZ. And if you look at the cell from the left, it would have cells from ZW. Whoa. This phenomenon happens in birds, many insects, and crustaceans. And uh, they say be sure to check out those butterflies that are half male and half female as well, with colors split down the middle as well. Amazing. But um, that's ex it's exciting, that. Part of what makes this, uh, this particular cardinal so exciting to Hooper is it may be able to reproduce. Whoa. Uh, they say most uh, gynandromorph individuals are infertile. But this one may, one may be actually be fertile as the left side is female and only the left ovary and birds is functional. The things you learn, Jim. The things you learn. I'm astounded. Uh, you do not look or even sound astounded. <laughs> but I love nature. And why do I love na nature, Jim? Because you find its perfection. It's. I just think there's so much perfection in nature. Honest to goodness. I do make Jim laugh. When we see roses, and I show him the rose, and I go, look at that. That's perfection in nature. And he has a good old laugh about it. <laughs> um, they said, um, we may soon find out. Uh, Shirley says the cardinal is always in the company of a male. We're happy it's not lonely. <laughs> and uh, researchers in Western Illinois observed another one of these cardinal birds several years ago and reported that they never saw it in the company of another cardinal. Hmm. In the meantime, the Coldwells get to observe this rare visitor from the kitchen window. They say it's like it likes to feed on generous portions of black sunflower seeds and suet on a pole feeder, not far from the lilac bush where it often perches. So who knows? Maybe we'll be lucky enough to see a family in summer. Oh, wouldn't that be nice? Wouldn't that, wouldn't that be lovely, Jim? Yeah, from Emily Hermaphrocard Cardinal. <laughs> <laughs> I like birds. It <laughs> doesn't matter to me that, uh, that there's this special double bird out there. We have lovely hummingbirds yeah. in our back garden, don't we, Jim? They are, well, they're lovely until you get near a nest, un unknowingly get near an, a nest, and then you, you, it feels like somebody threw a baseball right by your head or tried to hit you because when they fly by your head when they're not happy, you cannot believe it, and I had that experience. I forgave her, though. Yeah, because well, she really, she should have forgiven me because I actually didn't know I was near a nest that was on the other side of the wall that's not even my garden. She was not happy about it, but they're beautiful. I mean, really beautiful. So on that beautiful note, Jim, and the rare cardinal bird, I want to say thank you for running the show. It was a big topic today, wasn't it? And if you've liked the show, of course, you can share it from your smartphone or your computer and uh, tell everyone... What you know that you like the show? Tell your family and friends. I hope you hope you listen to the show and come away with something. You learn something, or we inspire you to do something. You know, with your pets. And uh, we always like you to remember. You can always help an animal in need. Either rescue, adopt, donate, volunteer, or share their information. Feed them a raw diet. How about that? Some fresh food. Rescue your next family member. Replace the word shop with adopt. And be kind to all animals. Again, thank you, Jim, for running the show. Everyone, please take a moment. Come come on over to our social media uh, profiles. If you come to our Facebook page, make sure you post a picture of your pets. We just love to see your fur babies. Don't forget to let us know what their names are. And today, you've been listening to Vegas Rock Dog Radio, where it's all about pets, people, and pop culture. I'm your host, Sam, the queen of rock and roll dogs. And always kiss your pets. Good morning and good night. And I'll see you next time. You've been listening to Vegas Rock Dog Radio. Pets. People. Pop culture. 
been listening to Vegas Rock Dog Radio. Pets, people, pop culture. Visit Vegas Rock Dog Radio for more information. Find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And subscribe on iTunes and iHeartRadio. And remember, give your fur babies a big kiss from me, Sam, the queen of rock and roll dogs. You must not rely on the information in this broadcast from our hosts as an alternative to medical advice from your veterinarian. If you have any specific questions about a medical matter regarding your pets, you should consult your veterinarian or specialist. 